Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Siddhartha Sinha. He, uh, is, uh, was an intern this past summer, did some fantastic work on uh, modeling from uh, Photosense. Uh, he'll be presenting some of that and also some of his uh, thesis work. Uh, so, Thanks, Drew. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, it's good to see many of you again. Uh, so I'll be talking today about various things related to uh, multi-view camera calibration and image-based modeling. And so the goal in all over here that we're trying to do is to capture 3D models from the re real world, uh, uh, from images and video in which they're seen. So in particular, I'm interested in these different settings. So we'd like to reconstruct dynamic scenes, such as this dance performance that's recorded on multiple viewpoints. Um, then we're also interested in modeling, uh, getting a good uh, high quality reconstruction of static objects from multiple images, such as the statue. And although you could use a laser range scanner to do, get a similar quality model, um, range scanners are expensive and uh, you'd prefer to use cameras for, uh, for this if you can get an equivalent quality. Finally, with the emergence of applications like virtual earth and with uh, with a lot of uh, with digital photography becoming so popular, a uh, lot of uh, there's a lot widespread interest in uh, modeling uh, outdoor scenes, buildings, architectural sites from a uh, collection of images. And so the methods that I will uh, present today will uh, I'll try to present some flexible methods to uh, solve some of these problems. So in particular, uh, I will present a method uh, to calibrate a network of cameras and also synchronize them. Uh, and the goal here is to ease the deployment of cameras for reconstructing a dynamic scene. And uh, I will present uh, how we, so we'll try to analyze motion of moving objects in the video and recover all the information from them. Uh, then I'll talk about some work in, on multi-view stereo. And uh, specifically what I try to do is if, uh, we have some ways, to, we have a formulation, a volumetric stereo formulation in which we'll be able to enforce silhouette constraints exactly. And also some work on uh, how we address the high memory and computational uh, overhead of the underlying method. So finally, I'll talk about this uh, interactive image-based modeling system. That's, so the goal here is slightly different. We really want to build a system which an ordinary user can uh, try out and use to build models from their own photo collections but we'll also use some automatic vision techniques to speed things up and make things scalable to handle a lot of photographs. So first I'll talk about calibrating cameras. So uh, many of you who are from CMU or who have been to CMU have seen this room. This is called the 3D room because there are cameras mounted uh, pretty much on all sides of the walls and uh, whatever is happening in that room can be captured from different viewpoints. And so this is a, oops, so this is a small section of a video. This is uh, Simon Baker, who is uh, now at MSR. Uh, the data was collected by German Chang uh, for some of his research. And uh, in order to use video streams like this and reconstruct what's happening, we need to, of course, calibrate these cameras. So mo most, uh, most multi-camera systems are nowadays calibrated using uh, calibration devices. and so. The most popular one is to use a calibration grid. Uh, there's also some work being done on using LEDs. Uh, and uh, so, but in all these methods, the user needs to go into the scene and collect explicit calibration data before the interesting th things start uh, being recorded. Vicon is also a motion capture system which has its own type of calibration uh, device. So, so these are some of the uh, practical dif difficulties which I want to address. Uh, namely that we would, uh, these offline calibration phases often need to be repeated if cameras move, and, and this becomes a, a tedious thing to do sometimes. And, uh, but most importantly, I would like to stress that uh, with physical access to the scene required, you can't now process archived video. That's some of, something that I want to address. So 
how question is how can we calibrate an unknown C? So this is again a short segment of another uh, uh, a person uh, doing something and cameras that are recording him are observing from, they have like white baselines. If you notice here, uh, the, there are very few foreground features uh, on the person and also the backgrounds overlap very little. So traditional structure from uh, motion uh, uh, techniques which rely on uh, correspondence of point features won't work very well in situations like this. But one of the major things that you observe here is the silhouette of the foreground person. And many multi-camera systems use silhouettes like this to model visual hulls anyway. Uh, so what I will present today is how can we use such silhouettes to also recover the camera calibration. And uh, just to, to make one point, uh, background segmentation is, is considered a hard problem. And, and, and uh, I will not address it uh, today, but it's an important issue. Uh, however, the method we develop uh, can deal with imperfect da data, and we are robust to some imperfections in the silhouettes. Oops. So there has been work done on uh, camera calibration from silhouettes and also doing structure from motion. But none of the existing techniques really uh, can be directly applied to calibrate a visual hull system. In other words, a camera network observing some moving, some, uh, uh, moving object. And uh, so there are various limitations in these works, as in the work from Furukawa and Pons was for static objects. Uh, and they assumed an orthographic camera model. Some nice approaches uh, developed by Hernandez, Wong, and Chipola. But these are really well suited for turntable sequences and not for more general uh, camera configurations. So to quickly go over uh, how this would work, we are looking for correspondences on the silhouette uh, in multiple views. And so here, uh, are the, here are the silhouettes in two views and the corresponding rim curves, the curves which give rise to the silhouettes on the surface of the object. Now the only true correspondences on the silhouettes are some special points called frontier points. And these frontier points correspond, uh, if, you, if you consider these two viewing rays, their correspondences, uh, uh, the correspondences will give rise to a 3D point which is on the surface of the object. And these two viewing rays are actually meeting in the tangent plane of the surface. So that's how frontier points uh, arise. And so x1 and x2 obey the epipolar constraint. One additional uh, uh, property, if you drew the tangents from the epipoles to the, uh, to the silhouettes in each view, then the silhouettes would touch the, uh, so the tangents would touch the silhouette at the frontier points. So these two tangents are also matching epipolar lines. So they're called uh, epipolar tangents. So with seven or more frontier points, we could theoretically compute uh, the fundamental matrix here. Uh, but these are in general hard to find on one single silhouette. And in many cases, they could be occluded. So for instance, here is a camera pair with a horizontal baseline. And there is a frontier point here, which in the other image is not available. However, the extremal frontier points are never occluded. And this is something that we will use in our approach. In fact, uh, just to make an observation, if you took the convex hull of the silhouette, then uh, the convex hull and the silhouette have the same extremal points, uh, extremal frontier points. So somehow, if we knew where the epipoles are, there is a very nice way of uh, finding the fundamental matrix. So the epipoles, knowing the epipoles means you have, uh, four, you, you, you have four degrees of freedom there. And there are three additional degrees of freedom that you need to know in order to compute the fundamental matrix. So to do that, we would uh, simply draw tangents from the epipoles to the silhouettes. And here are three corresponding uh, epipolar lines. From that, we could compute an epipolar line homography. And then there's a well-known way of computing the fundamental matrix where E is the epipole uh, in, the, in the second image. So, but of course, we don't know the epipoles to start off with in, in when we want to calibrate this pair. So the solution we came up here, uh, came up with, was to randomly sample for epipoles in the two images, and then use a ransack-based approach to find the true epipolar geometry. And uh, just uh, before I describe the algorithm, the way this, uh, we represent silhouettes is we, a we actually compute the convex hull because of what I described to you before. We are interested in the frontier uh, points 
uh, the extremal frontier points and the convex hull and the silhouette will share the same frontier points. So with the, with the convex hull and with its dual representation, it becomes very easy, efficient to compute tangents. And so this, this compact representation, we can handle thousands of frames in the video. And, and this will be important when we work with real data. We would want to process as, as much data as we can. So the way this algorithm works is it makes many trials. In each trial, it, it makes a hypothesis and then ver verifies it. And to generate a hypothesis, uh, so uh, what I described now is for synchronized video. And later on, I'll talk about the unsynchronized case. So we pick two frames in random from the two sequences and then pick random directions in each. So we picked two random directions in each viewpoint, and then those directions corresponded to some uh, epipolar tangents. The intersection of those tangents gives us a hypothesis for where the epipoles are. Now we simply pick another pair of random frames from the video, show them in gray, and from, from the epipoles, you draw, draw uh, another set of tangents. So these are shown in blue. So now you have these three pair of matching epipolar lines uh, you can compute the epipolar line homography, generate a hypothesis for the F matrix. To verify, we will now try to use all the silhouettes that are available to us. From each epipole, uh, epipole in each image, we draw tangents, transfer them using the hypothesized epipolar geometry, and then check for this, uh, the symmetric uh, epipolar error in both the images. So if by random we uh, sample the epipoles correctly, or very close to the true positions, then this error would be small. But of course, this is done in a, in a I mean, we expect some silhouettes to be bad, so we can we'll look for the number of inliers and then remember the good uh, guesses we made. And after that, we have uh, some work, something to refine those uh, estimates and get a good final answer. So here is a four ca camera. So I've drawn the network here. This is the two, two of the views. Uh, the data was uh, grabbed at MIT by Peter Sand, and this is 30 uh, video recorded at 30 frames per second. Uh, uh, we, this was all the data that was available to us. We have some heuristic for selecting keyframes, but we, we're still processing close to 1,000 frames in order to recover the calibration. Uh, so the user has clicked uh, points here, and we display. So this is to verify, visualize the epipolar geometry. And these are, this is the other view, uh, other link here in the network. Uh, uh, all, uh, so we try out all pairs in our network, and typically with, with 1,000 frames, this, this took between uh, two to four minutes. The longest one the, took four minutes to, to process. Uh, this is the data set from uh, the 3D room, and in this case, uh, we again tried out all pairs, but some pairs may not work that well. I will describe something more at the end. Uh, we, but we don't really need all pairs in order to calibrate the network. What we need is some redundant, redundant links there so that we can robustly do a projective reconstruction, and I'll discuss that later. So here, uh, user clicked points on this uh, image, and these are all the transferred epipolar lines. So if you note here, uh, that camera right there is uh, where the epipole is, and so that's what should happen there in this view as well. So. Some more data sets. This was collected by uh, Gabriel Brosto at uh, Georgia Tech. That is from, uh, this data set is from the uh, perception group at INRIA, Ronalps. And, uh, and again, we try out all pairs. This is showing some of the uh, links in the camera network. One, one, one situation, uh, one uh, scenario where the method didn't work well was when we tried video with uh, people in them and the, and the view uh, and, the, and the silhouette would get clipped at the and near the feet would, or the person would be missing. So what, tended, uh, what would happen is uh, all the frontier point uh, correspondences basically came from uh, a coplanar. They were all coplanar, the 3D points in the scene. And that's a degenerate situation. And that's one situation where this didn't work. Uh, but otherwise, we do deal, deal with uh, uh, clipped silhouettes. So the, in, in those cases, we would get one constraint from every video frame instead of two. So once you have all these pairwise links, now we have the step of incrementally building up a projective network. Uh, so the basic idea is to add one camera at a time and, and solve for a triplet of cameras. I will talk about that soon. Uh, but after that, it's pretty much a standard uh, structure from motion pipeline, self-calibration and bundle adjustment. So 
to solve for the triplet, so one thing I would like to point out is these uh, frontier point correspondences don't generalize to three views. They are purely two view correspondences. So we can't compute a trifugal tensor here the way you would do of an instructure for motion. So F13, F23, and F12 have been independently estimated. So in general, they will not be consistent with each other. So you would have to, uh, you would have to first adjust some of these links in some ways in order to get three. Uh, so if you wanted to compute three P matrices for one, two, and three, you can't directly use the measured fundamental matrices. So what we do is we uh, pick canonical cameras for one and two. This is like standard notation. And then uh, we compute, we have a linear method to compute uh, P3. Then the basic idea is we look for a solution. So F23 bar is the adjusted link, and F23 is the measured fundamental matrix. And so we, we look for a, uh, like a, um, so we look for a solution which is close to the measured one and agrees with the other two links. And, and doing that, let's, let's, let's compute uh, P3. So now that we have this way to solve for a triplet, we'll do this uh, uh, incrementally. Given a camera network with k minus 1 calibrated cameras, we look at this new camera, look for two links, two existing cameras in the network, and then that solving for the triplet lets us include that camera. That's the basic idea. Yeah. For that, we, uh, when I do that uh, computation, I'm reducing the Frobenius norm. Uh, so it's, it's algebraic. And uh, there's another way to do this. Uh, there's, uh, the, you basically uh, look at, uh, I think it's, uh, there's an algebraic way to, I uh, can't remember it now, but I think P, uh, but, but like, so the other method that I'm aware of is also minimizing algebraic error. And so at this step, I'm not sure if we can really come up with a geometric error metric. But after doing this, P1, P2, P3, we throw this into a projective bundle. So that uses the correspondences and minimizes reprojection error. So these are, these are only for initialization. So the projective bundle is, is required. So here is a, a synthetic data set. It has 25 views. And this is sort of the clip. It is like fast moving motion. And uh, with, with this data set, we again tried out all pairs, and it worked very well. The pair where it didn't work was if you have cameras looking at each other. So the epipole is in the center of the image, and if it falls inside the silhouette, then we can't really handle it. But it's still fine, because uh, we, to calibrate the camera network, we don't need all pairs. And so it still works, and this is the visual hull from uh, 25 views. So this is the result of the. Uh, the MIT data set, a short section is shown here. And this is the visual hull that was reconstructed. This is where the cameras were in 3D. OK, so I've talked about synchronized video so far. But there's a simple extension that, uh, that can be done to deal with unsynchronized video, provided you know the frame rate of the video. So all the constraints will still be true up to an unknown offset, unknown temporal offset. And we can actually just add a random temporal offset to the Ranzac hypothesis to try to recover that. So the goal is to recover the calibration and synchronization simultaneously. Uh, in, in practice, what we had to do was, because this could be a large offset, we do some uh, heuristics to first do a coarse alignment with some slow-moving keyframes. So the silhouette, uh, we have a heuristic for choosing slow-moving silhouettes. With those keyframes, we do some coarse alignment. And then we repeat it with another set of fast-moving silhouettes to get the final calibration and synchronization. So just a plot showing how what happens here. For this pair, we did uh, many trials. So this is much more than what you actually need. But we just want to show that with more and more trials, there's a very strong peak. Uh, th on the y-axis, we have the number of good solutions we found. This is the number of trials. And on the x-axis, we have the temporal offset. So there was a strong peak at the true offset here, which we knew beforehand. Uh, and also, we noticed some uh, secondary peaks, which, uh, which we, uh, we verified was due to some periodicity in the motion. So this data set is, some, is a motion capture data set where he sort of repeats the same thing. And there's a clear periodicity that we observe here. OK, so again, we have uh, estimated these links independently. And they're not going to be consistent in general, because there'll be noise in, in those measurements. 
But uh, if we check for these loops in the network, we ex expect them to be close to zero because, and these are directed links. So when you, when you sum them up, you expect them to be zero. Uh, we use that to detect uh, outliers if there are any and throw them out. After which we do, uh, we do a weighted least squares estimation of the, of the clocks for each of the cameras. So if this is a very, uh, if this is a completely uh, connected graph, complete graph, then this is very uh, constrained. Uh, so one thing to point out is with this MIT data set of four minutes, we are doing very close to ground truth. So uh, this, is the, this is the number of, uh, this is the offset in the number of uh, frames, uh, and this is 30 frames per second. So the difference here is almost uh, close to one hundredth of a second. So with that, synch with that subframe offset uh, that we were able to calculate, we tried, um, we tried uh, interpolating some of the silhouettes. And this was because if you did the nearest neighbor interpolation, there were some frames where the visual hull uh, with the fast moving portions of the, uh, the arms and the legs would get clipped because you are ignoring the subframe offset. And we, when we did that simple interpolation, although this is a naive scheme, linear interpolation does not preserve shape. So that's not the right thing to do, but for a 30 frame per second video, this was able to correct some of the problems. Okay, so that I'll now talk about uh, the work we did with multi-view stereo. And uh, to, I'll not go into detail here, but these are some of the representative uh, work in this area, and a lot of promising results have been uh, uh, shown here recently. And I'm interested in uh, trying to combine these two cues um, and, and uh, try to use silhouette information in the best possible way within this multi-view stereo framework. Uh, and so here is, uh, so this will be a global uh, formulation. So this is, uh, uh, so global volumetric formulation. And uh, yeah, so if you, if you know what the visual hull is or have some idea of an outer bound of the surface, uh, the volumetric formulation, uh, what it does is you, you look for a surface embedded in that volume. So this is a uniform grid, volumetric grid, a voxel grid. And this is a, an inner surface at a constant distance from the visual hull. Uh, so you, your underlying assumption is that the surface lies in between these two. So this can be, uh, this can be posed as an um, uh, optimization problem. So we are interested in finding a surface which minimizes a surface cost functional. That the you know the inner offset is fixed distance valid. I mean, it seems like it could be arbitrarily badly violated. Yeah, it could be badly violated, and uh, we we did some work on that. We wanted to find this ourselves without making this assumption. So, if you are trying to reconstruct a cup with a hollow concavity, right. then yeah, this this will not work. So, this this is only a uh, for objects which are which have shallow concavities, and uh, so it's not a good thing to do. But uh, I initially when I did this work, we we assumed this, so we had this uh, inner offset and did some work. And after that, I'll present it briefly at the end. We have a way of finding where the inner offset really needs to be automatically. Okay. So I'll come to that. Uh, so, so the basic idea is that if we have a point in the 3D scene, which is a true surface point, then if you project uh, that point into the set of cameras where the point is visible, then the local uh, the appearance of that patch should be the same. That's the notion of photoconsistency, which is used. So Fs is a notion measure of the inconsistency. And so by trying to minimize this integral, we are hoping to find a surface which passes through all the photoconsistent regions. So the way this is done is we want to partition this 3D space into inside and outside. And, and uh, that, is, uh, the, that partitioning is essentially a binary labeling problem. And uh, such a binary labeling problem uh, so the global, uh, global optimum to such a binary labeling problem can be computed using graph cuts. And this is similar to the formulation, the graph cut that has been uh, uh, presented in uh, with like 2D grids. This is also optimizing uh, a Markov random field. But some differences though, uh, here uh, photoconsistency is directly, is used to uh, come up with an interaction term in the MRF. Uh, so for, for a small edge here, connecting two nodes in the graph, you compute the photoconsistency at the midpoint of the edge. And that's how you come, you, you come up with a pairwise term. However, there's no direct way, in the, in the basic formulation, there's no direct way to come up with a data term. Because photoconsistency only tells you if you are on the surface or away from it. 
it doesn't tell you whether you are inside the surface or outside. So, okay, so, so that's the basic uh, graph cut formulation. Uh, there's one more problem that it has, and uh, because it's a global uh, formulation, it tends to have this uh, minimal surface bias. So if you did not regularize your solution, it's quite possible that your global, uh, your global optimum would be a solution like this. So this is a house that was reconstructed and the chimney basically disappeared because the uh, energy of this surface is lower than the energy of the true surface. So to fix this, uh, the original work, they introduced a ballooning term in the energy function. And basically what it does is it's a uniform prior to favor uh, larger volumes. So by doing that, you can restore the protrusions like here. The, the value is experimentally, you have to do trial and error to come up with it. Uh, but uh, the problem is that while it restores, restores the protrusions, the concavities are also affected, and it affects the whole solution everywhere. The, the global, uh, the term is, it's a constant that you sort of uh, add everywhere. So the final result uh, is much, is, could be less accurate because of this. Yeah. Is that taken into account in the energy function? Okay, so yeah, so that's something that has been uh, dealt with differently in the beginning. In this work, what they did was, because they have this assumption of a shallow uh, concavity, they use the visibility of points on the visual hull. So, uh, so if, the, if the topology of the visual hull reflects the true, uh, uh, is the same as the topology of the surface, then those, that visibility is approximately good. Some later work uh, has been done where you purely treat that as, a, as an outlier. So while combining the matching function from different pairs of images, you, if you have outliers, you, you would basically get, a, sorry, if you had occlusion, you would treat that as an outlier. And that has also been done uh, later on. But in this work, it wasn't done that way. So, so it's the, the two choices are using a proxy. So visual hull is a proxy for estimating the uh, visibility. If the visual hull is fairly good, then it works. But if the visual hull is not available, or if the, it's very inaccurate, then it's bad. So there's the trade-off. Okay. So uh, what, what we... Uh, what we wanted to do was to use silhouette constraints to enforce, so to make the, to prevent the surface from shrinking. And the main idea is that we will enforce this as a strong constraint, as a, as a sorry, as a hard constraint in the graph cut. And we'll do it by construction. So we'll force the cut to actually touch the silhouette in the right, uh, the visual hull in the right places. So out of those, the min cut would be the most photoconsistent surface. And so that's the basic idea behind the graph construction, which I will now describe. So some work was done, nice work by Franco and Boyer on computing polyhedral visual hulls. And the nice thing is that the visual hull here is a, is a watertight manifold mesh, and it's obtained by the intersection of cones from back projected from these silhouettes. And these are shown in the different colors here. So, uh, so yeah, so this is the close up. And, uh, there are a lot of planar facets in the mesh, except the note, thing to note is that there are these two kinds of edges. So view edges are the edges which are obtained by back projecting points on the silhouette. Whereas the cone intersection edges, these dark black lines, are obtained when the cones themselves intersect. So the view edges are, are different because along the view edge, you expect to find at least one surface point. Whereas the cone intersection edges, in general, would be outside the exterior to the surface. Uh, also, if you took all the view edges together, they form this kind of a ruled surface. And I, we, we refer to that as a cone strip. And so this, if you take the pink, uh, uh, all the pink view edges, you can lay them out, and that would form uh, a cone strip. And within that cone strip, you can actually uh, see the rim or the contour generator curve. The contour generator is where the, the cone would actually touch the underlying object surface. Now, there are some, some complications here. The, the rim could be disconnected, and there could also be these multiple uh, segments to the view edge. Uh, and we, we deal with those here while doing the graph construction. But I will not go into detail there right now. Uh, so another interesting property that we use is, uh, in the graph construction is that if you consider the silhouettes of an, of an object from multiple viewpoints, and if you drew the rim, if you actually plotted out the rim curves on the surface, then these curves divide up the surface. So we have an arrangement of curves, 
and these patches can be two colored. And the main intuition is each rim divides the surface into two parts, the front facing with respect to the camera and the back facing. And so if you just, uh, if this is already two colored, uh, we can inductively prove by adding a new rim, what we'll do is all uh, patches which are front facing with respect to the dotted rim, we'll just switch their colors. Whereas all, uh, all the patches which are behind, we won't switch them. Just doing that, we can, we can sort of get the idea of why this will always, always be too colorable. So, but the, but the, although this holds, we don't know the surface, so to, we can't really two color the surface. What we instead try to do is two color the visual hull. And uh, more specifically, we will try to assign a binary label to the visual hull vertices. And so that's what I show here. These are the visual hull vertices which have been two colored. And so the idea is that if you, as you march along the view, viewing edge, and as you touch the surface, the color, color would change. So this, this is basically an illustration showing how the two coloring could possibly look like. Uh, this is not exact because the rims are arbitrary here. I've just done it for visualization. Can you say everything you just said once more because it went by too fast? Okay, uh, sorry. Uh, so the visual hull uh, mesh, uh, what we are interested in is uh, two coloring the vertices. the vertices. Yeah, so there are no vertices here because we have these uh, long view edges. The only vertices are along the cone intersection curves. So, when, so what I'm really showing you is uh, a zoomed out view. So there are all, these are all tiny vertices, and, but really it looks like the whole cone intersection curve has been colored red or blue. Red or blue, and there are some green edges as well? Okay, so the green edges are obtained. I was going to talk about it later. That's basically because when we do the two coloring, uh, I'll go forth, uh, forward just to show what I'm saying. So the cone intersection edges first need to be connected up because there are these breaks. When the cones intersect, then you, these would, you get things like these uh, because we are dealing with uh, discrete data. So, so when we connect up these edges, we mark those as, as rim edges. And uh, those, those are important because uh, there will be places like here where the tangency is missing. Or if you have T-junctions on the silhouette, then you'd also get uh, those green uh, connections. So those are the ones I've, I've shown here, but I've not talked about it. Mm. So let, let me go ahead and I'll, I'll mention where, where those are important. Um, okay, so, so, once, uh, so we have this way of two coloring the visual hull. Again, there's some detail here which I, I uh, wasn't planning to cover. But the main idea is that if you could uh, fix up the rims in this way, you would now be able to partition the surface into front and back with respect to that cone strip. So I've colored the visual, uh, the view edges, uh, the vertices of the view edges white and blue for front and back, and then you can spread that label, flood it over the whole mesh. So doing that with respect to all the different viewpoints, uh, you would end up with something like that. Now we'll simply, simply look at an uh, 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 n-bit co signature where each bit uh, is set to 1 if the vertex is labeled front with respect to that view. So we have n bits corresponding to n cameras. And for each bit, we, have, we set it to 1 if it's front facing with respect to that view. So when we check the parity of this code, if it has an even number of, uh, if it, it has an even number of bits set to 1, then we'll color them red. Otherwise, we'll color them blue. And this is the basic idea behind the, uh, the graph construction, uh, the two coloring, which we'll now use in the graph construction. So here is a simplified picture of the visual hull in 2D. Here are the two colored vertices. This is the grid and the offset layer. And uh, we also have vertices, uh, graph nodes on the surface of the visual hull, which I don't show. The first step is to just duplicate the graph. Now, we'll color all the nodes on the inner offset in G1 red, and those in G1, uh, G2 blue. So all blue vertices will be connected to the source and all red vertices, vertices would be connected to the sink. So one more step in the, in the construction. We are going to connect up all the nodes on the surface of the visual hull with uh, its mirror copy in the other graph. So I've not shown you all these edges, but there are a number of edges for every single node that appears on the surface. So this is, we have duplicated the size of the problem, but now when you compute the, the binary, uh, cut, all the blue nodes need to be separated from the red nodes. So in order 
for that to happen, what we end up getting is patches reconstructed in G1 like these and patches reconstructed in G2. But each of these patches must terminate somewhere on the visual hull. So that's this, I have this animation trying to uh, explain what is going on. So if you put those patches together, you'd basically get the reconstructed surface and it would, uh, and these blue and red patches would uh, join on, on the surface of the visual hull. So there's one thing that I've not talked about here is how we deal with T-junctions. Because when you have a T-junction, there is actually a situation where the surface needs to detach from the visual hull in order to get the right re reconstruction. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I will talk about that uh, later, but this is uh, basically showing the reconstruction on the, uh, uh, of the pear-shaped object. It's a, a simple synthetic object. And so these are the reconstructed patches which we got from the two uh, separate graphs. Uh, so with, with this is on a real uh, object, and here uh, this data set we had 36 images, but we dropped half of these for the visual hulls because it was a turntable sequence, and uh, we did there were like duplicates of each other. So here we, what what I'm showing here, the green curves here are are the reconstructed rims. So a place like this on the crown, you end up getting a lot of rims there, and the visual hull really is very accurate in that part, and the patches are very small. Over here, the visual hull uh, has a very big patch, and stereo helps you get the, the depth in that part of the, of the surface. Okay, so dealing with uh, T-junctions, so currently the system, uh, so for a convex shape, this would be perfect, the formulation that we proved, uh, presented. But for, uh, for uh, objects which have uh, T-junctions on the silhouette, what happens is we end up enforcing the silhouette constraint at places where we should not be doing that. But in reality, this is not a big problem. What happens is the surface uh, detaches. There's like a separate uh, portion of the surface reconstructed, uh, which is detached from the, uh, from the cut surface. So at the final step, we, do, uh, we, do, we fit a uh, mesh to our points. And uh, so we used uh, the poison surface reconstruction code from uh, Kazdan and, uh, and Hughes. And so that let us actually treat these uh, little pieces of surface sticking out as outliers. And so, in, 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 so there are like some places where we have small uh, um, artifacts, and, but this is the result of the graph cut. And uh, if you do some post-processing on this, some local refinement, uh, then we ex expect those problems to, to go away. So although it's not perfect, it's still uh, something that we are not able to handle perfectly in this framework. So we did some more work here, and this, this tried to address some of these other issues, like we didn't want to depend on a base surface. So work, some work on, uh, by Lempitsky and Boykov in 2006, they showed how to, uh, how to basically come up, how to solve a global, uh, how to find the global optimal of a suitable cost function without needing the base surface. Uh, the problem with their approach was the high uh, memory overhead. So here we do a similar, uh, we, we, fo we follow that same uh, line of work, except we propose a way to construct a tetrahedral mesh of the whole volume in an adaptive fashion. So the difference from here compared to the previous work is that the graph cut uh, in, this, uh, in this work is done on a tetrahedral uh, mesh. So the nodes of the graph correspond to the tetrahedrons, and the edges correspond to faces that the two neighboring tetrahedrons share. And you can get a directly, uh, uh, when you do the graph cut on the, on the dual of the mesh, you can get a triangulated surface directly from it. So other than uh, doing the photoconsistency uh, adaptively, we also now have a way of indirectly using the photoconsistent patches to, uh, to distinguish exterior from interior. This is something that uh, will solve the, many of the problems of the naive ballooning term. So the, the basic idea is the following. Yeah. The oh. With all the oh, sorry. Yeah. This. So while doing the the mesh refinement, we are uh, we sort of keep. We remember a, a few uh, very strong uh, photoconsistent patches. So what we have here is a sort of a quasi dense reconstruction, but the problem is that the patches may not be at the right depth. So this this. Uh, I mean, we haven't tried reconstructing surfaces using these, but some filtering would be required and some some local alignment because the normals may not be correct. So this is sort of an inaccurate 
with some correct patches, but there could also be many patches which are slightly off the surface. And comparing oh, so this is the graph cut output, and we do some local refinement. So this is a complete overview. This is the solution from the graph cut, mm -hmm. and because of the uh, regularization, some uh, details are missing, but we do some more remeshing and local perturbations to, to, to nudge the vertices around to get some more detail. And comparing the rightmost image to the one on the previous slide, which was your previous technique, yeah. is, it, is it a better visual quality, or is it just faster? Uh, so uh, the correct comparison would be to compare this with uh, the silhouette uh, based work and they're they're of comparable quality uh, and this this data set uh, I think is more uh, sort of uh, so the benefits of uh, doing the silhouette uh, uh, enforcing the silhouette constraints is hard to show on this data set and so um, so I need to try out the uh, the silhouette based uh, approach on on a, on a different data set where I think it would uh, shrink without the ballooning term that's the main uh, I think the main issue yeah. Um, so, so the main idea behind doing the refinement is we want to start with a coarse subdivision of space and quickly prune out places like these where we think surface does not exist. And we do that by testing photoconsistency on the faces of the, uh, of the tetrahedrons. So we will inspect, we'll densely sample the triangular faces. And uh, for a face like this, which crosses the unknown surface, there will be some evidence of photoconsistency there. Whereas for uh, uh, faces like these, we won't find that uh, those uh, photoconsistent points. So while do, by doing that over for all the faces in this coarse triangulation, we make the observation that for if if a tetrahedron like the one here does not have any crossing faces, the blue ones, then we can prune this out because it will never contain any surface inside it. If there is no evidence, if there's no evidence on the surface, then there won't be any surface, uh, there won't be any portion of the unknown surface inside that cell. So, so that, that helps us prune out all those red tetrahedrons. And so we need to do a thresholding here, but we do it conservatively. And if, if some parts of the surface are textureless, then we'll, that part would be fattened up and we would refine it there, but it would still be okay as long as we have a conservative threshold. What about so, 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 so what I don't mention is when I compute the photoconsistency, I actually, uh, I, I, we have this uh, robust, uh, so we don't have any notion of what the surface is. We only use the orientation of the point to find the, uh, uh, to compute the photoconsistency. And so if there are occlusions, we hope that uh, uh, it would be treated as an outlier. Consistency term is a robust metric. Yeah, it's a robust mean. When you combine the NCC pairs, we we do a, a robust mean. So if some some of the pairs are, uh, uh, even if it's a true point, some of the pairs can be bad, and the final score would still be. So your basic photo consistency measure is pairwise normalized cross correlation. Yes, and so actually at this step, we don't even know the surface normal. So we need to try out different orientations. So for a point here, we try out actually six six different orientations. Mm -hmm. Um, also, basically, the X, Y, Z, six different orientations. For each orientation, we pick a set of cameras and try to ask, is this photoconsistent? So, yeah. Um, yeah. So, at this step, we would further refine this, and then we end up with something like this, where now we are going to compute the photo. Now we have a triangle which we want to evaluate as a surface patch, so we have a fixed normal to it. So, now that normal will be used to select the cameras. And here, if, if something is occluded, then, then out of k views, we expect some fraction to be, uh, uh, they won't correlate with the rest. So, so here, we will only evaluate photoconsistency on the blue triangles. We have some way of thresholding and saying that the, these are clearly not surface. So the thing that we have now is, for each of these photoconsistent patches, just looking at the visibility with respect to some cameras in which it correlates tells us what is free space. So if you march along the line of sight from the patch to the camera, clearly that must be unoccluded. And so uh, we uh, use that information now to compute some likelihood of how likely is a cell, uh, how likely is it uh, outside or versus inside. And this information is used as the data term uh, in, in, in this version of the graph cut. 
So, so the photoconsistency, this is the, uh, the edge cost and, and this, is the, this gives the data term because the nodes are associated with tetrahedrons. So cell cost is basically the uh, likelihood of being interior versus exterior. So some uh, similar ideas were also proposed at the same time. This was in a paper in CVPR and this was in ICCV, but they used the same idea to, to come up with uh, this data term at the same time. So this is the result on the, on the graph card and then we do some more remeshing and local perturbation to get some more detail for here. So these are more results, uh, again, similar type of data, data sets. These are, these are showing the results on the uh, Middlebury uh, evaluation data set, the diner ring and the temple ring. From the local point of view, you turn off the regularization term and allow it to go to the Yeah, we also have a, have a smoothness force. And, and uh, so there's, there are some uh, problems in over here. We'd like, if you look at the result, the, the smoothness doesn't seem to work very well. And it's, it's a question of how do you um, uh, balance the texture force versus the smoothness force. And, and this, this, this implementation had, had some problems. It's not perfect. So in the local refinement, the, lower the regularization term? Uh, well, it's like at every vertex, you compute a smoothness force for which we do like a Laplacian in the mesh. And, and that, so that's basically a displacement for the vector. So we also do, uh, based on the current uh, surface normal, we take steps and ask, well, is this a more photoconsistent point? So we push the vertex to the local maxima. That's another displacement. So these forces uh, ideally should all point to the same in the same direction, but we basically um, yeah. So so it's a, like a force. We call those forces like because they are like local displacements. Yeah. So what's the stopping criterion for refinement? Uh, stopping criterion is really uh, we look at the displacement in the number of pixels, and I think I set it to something some some number. Uh, so I mean, uh, if like, oscill like oscillation is uh, something that should not happen, but if uh, if it does happen, I don't deal with it right now. Uh, yeah. Okay. Oh, so yeah, some quick. In a textureless region, you probably would stop refinement because there's no more detail to be obtained. Uh, yes, uh, and do we do that? Yeah, I, I don't think I do that. But so in the in the textualist region, the the local minima doesn't for the texture force doesn't really make sense, and so I think the right way to do it would be to to uh, downweight that term, and then it would should just use smoothness in in that that part of the of the uh, um, that part of the surface. Yeah. So at, at this point, in the last three years or so, there have been a large number a half dozen of these multi-view stereo algorithms developed. What do you think are the advantages or potential disadvantages as viewers compared to some of the most recent algorithms? Um, so, like some of the, some of the recent algorithms have uh, really uh, tried to do patch-based reconstructions. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think uh, one of the advantages there is you, uh, so in these global formulations, you can, uh, you try to uh, compute one solution for the whole surface, mm -hmm. and you get a manifold uh, surface, which is nice. Right. But sometimes, like this whole uh, this whole uh, problem of minimal surface biases, mm -hmm. uh, and trying to do this ballooning to prevent it from happening is a problem which doesn't happen in the in the local uh, um, sort of semi-local methods. And uh, I think uh, that's uh, so. The global methods are still nice, but we, because those other uh, classes of methods uh, can get a reasonably good uh, solution in a smaller amount of time, the, there's no, and these are all like volumetric methods. So, so even if you've sped them up, and they're still taking a lot of time doing the processing, and so it really seems like um, the, those methods would be doing equally well, uh, spending a lot less time doing the processing. This is my uh, this is how I feel, yeah. but. Um, yeah. So okay. So now I'll talk about the work we did on interactive uh, image-based modeling. And for those of you who haven't seen this, I was an intern uh, last year here, and it was this was joint work with Drew, Rick, and also Manish Agarwala. I continued working on it after I went back to UNC. Uh, so again, in this area, there's been a lot of work done, and I've tried to categorize them. 
so the, this really started off with a uh, uh, nice work uh, called system called Facade, presented in 96, where uh, the user had to select a bunch of polyhedral uh, primitives for reconstructing buildings. Uh, and then they would take those polyhedral primitives and overlay them on the images. But to do this, uh, the user had to take corners and specify correspondences in the images. Very nice results, but this, uh, this whole modality is very laborious to use. And so if you want to process a lot of images, uh, it becomes really uh, hard and time consuming. But SUD gave rise to a lot of uh, nice uh, commercial products. Canoma, Photomodeler use the same modality. On the side, uh, computer vision, uh, in computer vision, a lot of automatic systems have been uh, proposed, and these have been improving over time. Uh, these scale very well, but in many cases, the quality is still not as, as good as something you would get out of facade. And that's still something people are working on. In the meantime, uh, Google SketchUp is, an, uh, is, a, is, a, is a system which has become really popular because this is, this is a normal 3D modeler, but it has a really nice uh, interface which is easy to learn, makes good use of snapping, inference, and also, they also recently came up with a simple uh, uh, version where they use images to drive the modeling. So, the, so this, this motivated us to really take some of the, uh, some of the uh, try to combine some of the automated system, uh, automated vision techniques with a nice interface like SketchUp. And that's basically what our work is about. Uh, a similar system uh, called VideoTrace uh, also does uh, modeling um, involving a sketching interface combined with uh, automated techniques. So here the user is sketching over that uh, Jeep. Some 3D is reconstructed, but as they move to another frame, there are further constraints, constraints provided to either fix the model or specify more detail. So this is the main modality of video trace. So I will, uh, this is uh, kind of showing a small data set, uh, 10 images of a playhouse and this model was uh, reconstructed in less than five minutes. It's a fully textured model of the scene. So how does this work? So the main idea in our system too is to combine user interaction with automatic vision techniques. And one, one of the goals uh, is to be able to scale to large photo collections. So automatic systems should help with that, but we don't want the user interaction to be proportional to the number of images. So we proposed to use vanishing point constraints at multiple places. And this really helped with the, uh, this really uh, helps to improve the sketching interface as well as the plane reconstruction step. So uh, I didn't tell you before is that our system is currently geared towards reconstructing a piecewise planar uh, model. So it's well suited for buildings, architecture, and uh, urban scenes. So, so yes, yeah, so uh, we use vanishing point constraints at multiple places. And finally, after the geometric reconstruction uh, step, we have a way of generating image-based texture maps. And the main idea here is that uh, not, we don't just want to paste images onto the model, but we also want to compute seamless composites from multiple images. And this is important to deal with uh, self-occlusion or other unmodeled geometry. So we also provide a semi-interactive way of fixing up the, some of the problems in the texture maps. So, uh, the automatic vision techniques we use are automa automatic feature matching. It's basically the photosynth pipeline, and this is a very sparse point cloud. But those sparse points are going to be used in the reconstruction. We show them overlaid in tiny red points here. Um, apart from that, we also extract vanishing points automatically. We compute three orthogonal vanishing points, and here I show them uh, grouped together in color. So the blue ones are all the lines which belong to the same vanishing point. So these would be used in our system. And the main sketching interface sort of looks like this. So the user is now uh, drawing a rectangle, modeling the front house, moves to a different view, now starts sketching out a polygon uh, for the side wall. So vanishing points are being used to, to uh, snap those user-drawn edges. Also, as he finishes, the plane reconstruction step happens in, at one step. So there's no further interaction required. And so there is this nice way of specifying a, a 3D rectangle, a, a rectangle in the scene directly in the image using two simple brush uh, strokes. So I'll show a little more of that. But so vanishing points are basically being used in the sketching interface. 
So it allows you to directly specify a rectangle like this with two strokes. And that's, they found this to be really easy to use. Uh, also, with this polygon tool, every edge that you draw essentially gets snapped um, to the right uh, uh, line segment. So now while doing this, we need to deal with this ambiguity uh, because uh, say if you have two family of uh, lines uh, and two different vanishing points and the user draws a horizontal line here in the middle of the image, then the snapping, uh, it could snap to either the blue or the green here. We don't really know. And so what we do to deal with this is we postpone the decision to the plane reconstruction step. And uh, while doing the plane fit, the ransack automatically decides which vanishing point uh, gives a better uh, solution. And so the plane fitting can, uh, can use, if there are no vanishing points, we just simply draw a polygon without any, with, with disabling snapping to vanishing points, then it would use three points to hypothesize a plane. But with one vanishing point constraint, you now need two more points to come up with the plane in 3D. Uh, for the rectangle, we have two vanishing points, so essentially the orientation of the plane is known, and you need only one extra point to find where it is in 3D. So we've made some more, uh, we've added some more features. So here are some sort of uh, some uh, tools in, the, in a 3D interface which would help with the modeling. So here the user selects two edges in a partial model, and a, and the missing plane pops up. So we call this the fillet plane. And it's useful for small structures, which are obvious. Uh, and since the roof and the sideboard was already created, it's, uh, this can be trivially created without going to the image. Um, here, uh, an existing polygon is being modified. So what happened was the wall was not completely visible in the whole image. And so the user created something, but now he wants to extend it. And notice that in the 3D, uh, th these are all basically our 3D uh, interface. And we have uh, projective textures blending onto the model. And in many ways, they are, they are guiding the user uh, to do the editing. So here uh, we show how planes can be welded. So these two planes were selected. And currently, this is being done manually. But we have, we've thought about ways to automate these kind of things. Uh, in this example, uh, the user replicates some polygons and simply copies them over knowing that all the windows are in the same plane. So once again, uh, the projected textures are providing feedback. Here we do some extrusions. Here, after the wall was reconstructed, the user draws out rectangles on the plane and, and simply replicates the windows, and then pushes them back to the right depth. So a lot of things are being done manu manually here, but in the next version of the system, we plan to automate a lot of these. Okay, for texture map generation, the system automatically comes up with its own guess of what the texture map should be, but sometimes the user wants to override it, and so here he's selecting on one of those source images. For a plane like this, one image is not enough, and so we'd like to combine these three uh, to automatically generate a, a seamless composite. So the graph cut is used to compute the invisible seams, and Poisson blending is done to remove whatever artifacts remain. So this is showing sort of the final result on, on the Playhouse. Um, so another data set, this is more in interesting, not as simple as the data uh, Playhouse. And one of the challenges here was to deal with all these occlusions. When you want to take a picture of a house like this, and this happens a lot in North Carolina, because uh, we have a lot of trees there, and I've really found it difficult to take pictures of a house uh, without any trees. So, um, so yeah, I just thought I'd mention that. Here, in this case, the user is drawing using the uh, rectangle tool, and these vanishing points for the roof lines had to be specified uh, manually, but we have an easy way to do that. Uh, so once this is in the 3D viewer, and the user has a way to uh, flip uh, the uh, roofs to complete the other side. It's really a small thing that we added. Here the polygon tool is being used for the side walls, and the snapping is on. Here we, we have a way of doing an auto weld. So the system also allows you to snap to existing planes which were already reconstructed. So once again, while drawing this edge, the system automatically did a snapping. Uh, here this roof plane will now be extruded to get the fascia board on the side. The, here the garage door is being cut out and it will be pushed back and the projective uh, textures will give some feedback here. Again, a lot of things can be automated, but this is uh, what we have so far. 
here the user is uh, editing the texture map and trying to get rid of this tree because the tree was not modeled. Uh, it got pasted there, and the system uh, does a seamless composite. So this is the final result. Here we show a time lapse animation of the modeling in progress. And so win details like the windows and, and doors were added later on. Uh, the final model is shown over the photographs. And this is the final model uh, that we built. This took about uh, 25 minutes. Uh, for, so I, was, uh, I, I built this model, so an experienced user took about 25 minutes. Um, so places like this gray region are, are places where we couldn't find an image, so it's simply not visible in any uh, views. Uh, okay. So here's another data set. Again, 100 images. Uh, person walked around the building. Uh, the course model was very easy, uh, created, took about eight minutes to build, but then more time was spent in uh, creating the details like the windows and the protruding parts. Uh, and uh, the final model took about 30 minutes to build. Um, in uh, this data set, uh, we have about 700 polygons. And this took a lot longer, about two hours, to do the full reconstruction. And a lot of time was actually spent in uh, fixing up the uh, texture maps. Because, uh, because of the occlusions, the severe amount of occlusion in the scene, uh, the automatic texture maps were not good enough. So the user had to go through the, each polygon and try to improve the texture map by combining other views. So, so that there, there's good high resolution texture on this building in the center. Oh, so I didn't, I, didn't te I didn't talk about it. So one of the things is view selection. So for a plane, we have a subset of views. Now, we use some heuristics to come up with this subset. And one of the heuristics is using uh, key point visibility. So when you do the plane fit, these points, we know which cameras they were visible in. So that's how we pick the views. But this heuristic is bad because um, uh, what will happen is uh, they will all tend to be sort of views uh, very close to each other because the points were matched well. But often a third view, which is far away, will provide more information about the texture, more coverage. Uh, and, and in this case, these buildings occluded each other. And so I had to manually uh, edit the, uh, the set of selected views. And then when I did a graph cut, with, and, and it incorporated information, these widely separated views, the texture map was more complete. So, uh, so yeah, that, otherwise you would see a lot of gray patches, essentially, on the walls where things are occluded. The geometry. Yeah, yeah, and uh, so we we do we do that, uh, except that um, uh, there there is still like um, yeah, so so in this case uh, a wall uh, like maybe pick any wall it's actually visible in many cameras. So even after you have pruned down, you may have thirty images to choose from, and uh, so if you look at this little uh, plane which is back here, uh, sort of set back, then the the plane the one single. Um, Okay, so, so to summarize, I, I don't have an answer to that. I don't have a one single solution to solving that problem, but occlusions uh, are useful and we do use it here. So if, uh, if something is reconstructed in front, we will not use uh, that image because we'll reason with the, um, with the interest points. Uh, well, I got a little confused actually, right? Uh, so if the geometry is not modeled, then there's, there's no hope to use uh, occlusions. So that's why the trees got pasted onto the onto the wall because we don't model them, but otherwise we do. Yeah, in this scene it's still uh, difficult, and there seems to be some other image uh, which would have been nice to use, but the system does not use it by default. Yeah. You, you do use a shadow buffer. Right, right, right. That's what I was. I got confused while answering. We do we do exclude view. So for instance, in the playhouse we had the fence and the wall. So while creating a texture map for the fence, we don't use pixels, which uh, uh, <laughs> so so we do use shadow buffering essentially to deal with uh, not using pixels where the geometry has been modeled. But for the trees, we don't model the geometry there, so we can't use that technique to avoid pasting the trees. Right, but providing right. a good view that gives you those windows inside the inset, the little inset in the, the thing. If you use the shadow buffer information in addition to the point yeah. cloud, you yeah. could. Yeah. Get a, yeah. so, cube. so the thing is, uh, this would work if you did the whole geometric reconstruction and then did the texturing later on. Right. But sometimes the user would want to quickly see a texture map, and since you don't haven't modeled the house in front, 
it would get pasted on. So th there's that issue that, that we don't deal with very well. Yeah. How did you choose this particular set of manual editing operations and how did you arrive at them? What was the process? Uh, it was a lot of brainstorming during the, uh, during the, uh, uh, the internship that I started. I think a lot of trial and error was involved and our first step was to have many of these things being done manually and uh, so the sketching interface was motivated by some work on, in the graphics community on sketch based interfaces. Uh, vanishing points were clearly something we wanted to use and we knew that it would help in these uh, situations. Um, we, we also have talked about doing this much more automatically. In fact, we were talking about it uh, today, uh, about the system could really use uh, plane fitting to come up with many guess guesses for what the main planes in the scene are. So the difficulty is specifying the, the outer polygon, the trim curve of the plane, because that is essentially a segmentation problem. And that's where computer vision is hard, humans are easier, uh, can do it more easily. So I, I think this, this system can be automated much more and it can be made more powerful. But it also needs like the 3D uh, modeling tools because uh, you may have an image, uh, you may have a plane visible only, only in one image and the system can uh, reconstruct that plane, although there's no multi-view geometry there. So there are, there are all these, uh, I don't know if I answered your question, but um, we could. So another, another thing was that implementing these is hard, right? We didn't have you know, true space sitting underneath everything to, to drive it. Right, so, 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 so if you look at, really look at the 3D modeling subset, we have only a few ones that we knew were easy to implement and would help us do some nice reconstructions. But there's a lot more uh, on just pure geometric modeling we could do. Uh, yeah. I think it's already pretty good by commercial standards. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so, so basically there are some of the things I already mentioned we wanted to automate. Handling structure from motion errors is, is important if you want an ordinary user to make this work. And maybe some interaction schemes where users can uh, fix up the calibration in the parts where the link breaks. In a structure from motion uh, sequence, typically there's like one place where the link breaks and we want to fix that up. We want to deal with these non-conventional styles also. And uh, of course, one thing which will clearly help you haven't done yet is line reconstruction. We've discussed this. It's, uh, it's something we want to do in the next version. Um, it'll help in different places, in the, in the interface, in the reconstruction, uh, and also automatic vanishing point estimation. So, so all this was joint work with my advisor, Mark Polyface. Uh, the work on calibration was done jointly with Leonard McMillan. Uh, st the stereo work was jo done jointly with Filippos Marduhai. And um, the work on image-based modeling was done jointly with Drew, Rick, and Manish. And I would also like to thank a number of people who have shared data sets with me and also source code for a lot of important uh, things that I use. So. That, that concludes my talk, and um, we'd like to thank all of you for coming. So, yeah. I think we have questions. Yeah.